In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Glory to Jesus Christ. The joy of the feast be with you. Christ is born. How many kept Christmas? How do you keep Christmas? What is the meaning of Christmas? God the Lord is born as a little child of the Virgin Mary. He is laid in a manger in the cave, in the cave, in the arms of his mother, and protected by the righteous Joseph. Or is it the child who is protecting Joseph and his mother? God the Word incarnate is hidden from the world. The Holy Family, Joseph, Mary, and the Christ Child, is an icon of the Church. And Herod and his soldiers, like Pharaoh and his armies, so many lackeys of the Prince of the Power of the Air, cannot find him in their desire to destroy him. But the shepherds and the magi who want to worship him are guided by the angels and by the stars of heaven, and they find him in the cave. And they join Joseph and all of creation in magnifying the Virgin as they glorify and worship her only begotten Son, God in the highest, now born in the flesh as a little child and laid in a manger in the cave. The icon of Christmas reveals what, or rather who, now dwells in the creation It reveals all of creation rejoicing in the spiritual essence of its being, rejoicing and worshiping the uncreated God who now dwells among us, sharing in our flesh and blood. So yes, how do you keep such a feast? Would it not be by following the shepherds and the magi to find the true Christmas hidden in the cave from the world. But how do you do that? What is Christmas meaning? What is it all about? So Christmas happens in the cave. In the cave, the uncreated, invisible God becomes visible in his created flesh, received from his mother, the Blessed Panagia, the All-Holy One. For me, the readings from the Royal Hours for Christmas brought the cave into view as the mystery of heaven and earth. The cave I saw as an image, even, of the Law of Moses. I saw it as an image of the Old Testament temple. Into the cave, into the heart of creation, into the very law of Moses, into the sanctuary of the temple, the Lord has come. All of creation has received into its sanctuary, the cave, its creator. The Lord God of Israel, born as a little child of the Blessed Virgin. She is the living temple. She is the real temple of which the Old Testament temple was but the shadow. But ultimately, the cave came into view to me as the mystery of the human body and soul. Hidden in the human heart now is the very image of God in whom we were made. But all of creation, together with all of mankind, is subject to death and corruption because of man's transgression. The cave of Bethlehem, then, is the mystery of death. In its inner reality, the cave of Bethlehem is a tomb. But now the tomb is the Lord's tomb. It's the tomb of God. Might this explain why the slaughter of the holy innocence 
is so prominent in the church's celebration of Christmas. We read of Herod slaughtering the innocents, the male children, two years and under. We read that awful gut-wrenching story at the feast of Christmas itself. We read it again at the synopsis of the Theotokos on the day after Christmas. And this morning on the Sunday immediately following Christmas, we are reading it again. Why? Could it be that this gut-wrenching evil of the slaughter of the innocents is the key that opens the hidden meaning of Christmas? Let's start at the surface, outside the cave, as it were, with, basic, with a basic lesson. The slaughter of the innocents sets before us the evil that is in the world, and you cannot gloss over it. It is in the world. It is unspeakable. It is gut-wrenching. It is awful. But I think more subtly, we need to recognize how this evil, this gut-wrenching evil that comes into view in Herod's slaughter of the innocents. This, dear brothers and sisters, is the reality that also hides in the empty seductions and promises of the pleasures of this worldly life. This is where those promises would take us. Through these empty promises and seductions, the prince of the power of the air, through all of his Herods and his pharaohs, is seeking constantly to lay hold of us in order to destroy the image of God, Christ, who is in us. But now let's go into the cave. Let's enter the cave of Bethlehem. Here, the prince of, this, of the power of the air cannot come. Indeed, I think he dare not come here because the Lord is here. When we enter the cave of Bethlehem, we have entered the mystery of the Lord's tomb. And we begin to see that Christmas opens onto Pascha, onto Easter. And in the cave of Bethlehem, in the slaughter even of the innocents, we begin already to see the fearsome wonder and the terrible glory of the power and light of Christ that the darkness cannot overcome, let alone find if the Lord does not will it. And looking at the gospel story, it strikes me that the only time that the Lord wills that the darkness should find him is at his Pascha on Easter. And when by his voluntary suffering he permits the darkness to overcome him, he destroys it and gives life to all those in the tombs. So here we are in the cave. Brothers and sisters, this is the cave. We are in the cave. We're like St. John now. Remember St. John came into the cave, the empty tomb of the Lord. He looked, he saw, he beheld, and suddenly the scriptures were open to him and he understood. Here we are in the cave. What do we see? Well, let me share with you what I see. The last day of Great Lent is Lazarus Saturday, right? We celebrate the Lord raising Lazarus from the dead. And the church proclaims that this raising of Lazarus from the dead, the universal resurrection even before the Lord's Passion, from Lazarus Saturday, we move into the Lord's triumphal entry into Jerusalem and the beginning of Holy Week, the beginning of the Lord's Holy Pascha. On the last day of Holy Week, which is Great and Holy Saturday, 
at the end of the matins for Great and Holy Saturday, which we sing on the evening of Great and Holy Friday. You remember that we leave the temple and we process around the church three times, following the shroud with the image of Christ's corpse before us. Then, still led by the shroud, we come back into the church. We pass under the shroud and we come into the nave where we were before. But mystically, can you see that in this action, we are leaving this world of death and corruption in order to follow Christ into the cave of his tomb. Mystically inside the cave now, we gather round the bier on which rests the image of the crucified God's corpse. And standing before it, do you remember what happens? We proclaim in a loud voice the prophecy of Ezekiel. Thus says the Lord God, Behold my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. I shall put my spirit within you and you shall live and I shall place you in your own land. Then shall you know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and I have done it. Beloved faithful, at the Matins for Christmas, there is this wonderful hymn. Of old, the master that works wonders saved his people, making the watery wave of the sea into dry land. The hymn is talking about the crossing of the Red Sea, how the people of Israel crossed the sea as though it were on dry land. The hymn continues. And now of his own will has he been born from a maiden. And so he establishes a path for us, whereby we may mount to heaven. This hymn from Christmas goes with the troparion from the Atoikos, the book of the eight tones. We come upon this hymn. Of old, the strangely solidified path amid the sea Revealed thy birth giving, O pure one. Thy birth giving, of course, refers to the Christ born of the Virgin. He is the strangely solidified path amid the sea, which is the sea of death. As Israel was able to pass through the Red Sea on this path, on this path and cross over to the other side, so also. All who in the fear of God, with faith and love, draw near to the Christ God in the cave, come upon this path that leads through the waters of death into the resurrection on the other side. That path, of course, is Christ. This is to say that in the cave, in the cave of Bethlehem, in the Lord's tomb, our grave is opened. And in walking in Christ, the strangely solidified path, we are brought out into our own land, the kingdom of heaven. That's why the Lord's tomb is empty, brothers and sisters. The Lord's tomb is empty because there's no death in it. Every corpse laid to rest in the Lord's tomb does not survive. For as soon as that corpse is laid into the tomb of Christ, it is raised to life and led out onto the other side. And the Lord's tomb remains forever and eternally empty, empty of death, empty of corpses. There are no corpses in the Lord's tomb. There are no corpses in the church. This mystery of the cave of Bethlehem and the Lord's holy Pascha is what we see hiding in the heart of this gut-wrenching slaughter of the innocents. Put to death by the sword, the innocents go down into the grave. But are not the infants slaughtered for the sake of Christ? That's what the hymns were telling us. They were slaughtered for Christ. Their graves then 
like their, their graves, take them then into the Lord's cave, into the Lord's tomb. And there in the mystery of Christmas, we behold the ineffably tender love of the Virgin and her child, whom the Herods of the world are seeking to destroy together with all those who are like him, all those who are like Christ, as were these innocents, having been united to him in baptism into the likeness of his death. And Herod can't find them. They have disappeared into the cave of death, the cave of the Lord's death, the cave of the Lord's tomb. The Lord remains hidden, and those who are united to him remain hidden. For having died in Christ, as St. Paul says in Colossians, having died in Christ, their life is hidden with Christ in God. As these holy innocents are struck down then, they go down into the grave. They enter the cave of Christmas. They enter the cave of the Lord's tomb. There they are gathered into the loving arms of the Lord's most merciful mother. She is the Rachel, the you. Rachel in Hebrew means, means you. It's a mother sheep. The Theotokos, the Virgin Mary, is the Rachel, the mother sheep, in this morning's prophecy from Jeremiah. She's the Rachel, the mother sheep, who was weeping for these, her children, just as she wept for her son at his life-giving cross. The innocents come into the cave, Coming into the cave, they come into the embrace of the most loving Mother of God. And in the embrace of the loving Mother of God, they are gathered up into the outstretched arms of her Son, the Savior, on the cross. In his visceral, gut-wrenching compassion, you remember how many times we come upon that word? When the Lord goes around Galilee healing people, remembers the verb, the verb that was used to describe his, feel, his, his love for the widow who had lost her son. He looked upon her and he felt splongna, visceral compassion. And that word we find several times in the gospel. And on his cross, in his visceral, gut-wrenching compassion, he cries out with a loud voice as he did at the tomb of Lazarus. And on the cross, as it says in the Greek, he sends forth his spirit and he opens their graves. That's from Matthew chapter 27. And in opening their graves, he empties their tombs. They are no more, it says just as the righteous Enoch was no more. And like the righteous Enoch, these holy innocents are taken up into Christ's holy resurrection. And the church, which is the mystery of Christ, embraced by his mother and Joseph, knows them as martyrs. Thus we see that the slaughter of the innocents is in fact the beginning of the fulfillment of Ezekiel's prophecy that we will read before the Lord's tomb on Great and Holy Saturday. Dear brothers and sisters, Christmas, its meaning is, if you will, that the Lord's Pascha has begun. Glory to Jesus Christ. Amen. So this is Christmas. Amen. Most holy Theotokos save us.